Asia as a startup nation, uh, I will tell you right off the bat, a, a lot of this is by you. So I figured uh, we can have a really good conversation about what startups are doing in Asia. And if you wanted information that you could just Google and stats, I don't find that very interesting. You could just kind of do that. You don't need to be here to do something like that. Uh, so a lot of this is my own view, uh, backed up with people that I've worked with over the years in Asia. Um, let me give you a little bit about my background. Um, I got the same clothes on right now as I have that photo. <laughs> Uh, uh, my name is Joseph Ziger, there's my uh, Twitter ID and all that. My own background is I, I'm a geek, I'm a nerd. Anyone here a programmer? Whoa, oops. Come on. Anybody here a programmer? Any programmers? All right, best job ever. <laughs> so I started off as a programmer. Uh, I started off actually as a developer at a company called Netscape. Uh, that was back in 1995. Who here was born after 1995? Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was my very first startup. Uh, a lot of people say that's probably the first real kind of uh, internet startup. That was a great ride. The IPO, that one was in the NASDAQ. Uh, my second startup uh, was actually a company, uh, it was a startup called uh, NetGravity. Uh, it IPO'd on the, on the uh, NASDAQ also. So my first, very first two companies, we IPO'd. Uh, that company became a company called DoubleClick. And uh, at the time, it was, it was purchased by this, what I thought was a silly, obscure uh, search engine, uh, because we had like AltaVista and, and Yahoo uh, called Google. I should stay in that one. Uh, so have you guys ever seen banner ads? Yeah, everywhere. I did that. Because 90% of the revenue of uh, Google, it's all my fault. Uh, and uh, it, it has paid for lots of great things. Uh, in the same time, I've done lots of uh, other startups Pretty much my whole life has been startups. Uh, the first few were all Silicon Valley. Uh, then I did a few uh, based in Asia, I did a few based in Australia. Uh, my most recent one was a company called Iris Data Services that I did out of Australia. But uh, actually, I just, I just sat in Australia, and I had my developers there. Uh, but the company was in the US, and because the, the company was actually in Kansas. Uh, and the beaches in Kansas are not that great. Uh, so I did that one from Perth, because the beaches in Perth were pretty darn good. Uh, we sold that one in April for 134 million. Uh, there was about five of us as the original founders. Uh, so that one was really, really nice. And then I had a couple of uh, Australia ones. Uh, I had one called Index Media of Australia that I sold off in Melbourne. Uh, and that one, uh, at that one I made $10,000 after a year. So that was my fourth exit. It wasn't the biggest one. <laughs> but I still count it as a win. Uh, but that's basically my own background. Uh, I used to work for Amazon Web Services. That was my first real job. Uh, and I got to uh, work throughout the whole region with a lot of VCs, a lot of accelerators, a lot of startups. Uh, it gave me a great view of the entire ecosystem here. Uh, and I've had some more startups myself. I've got a uh, venture builder uh, based in uh, Saigon right now. <coughs> Uh, I've also done uh, my own angel investments. Um, I've invested in My Republic, there's a company in Singapore. Uh, I've got another company I've invested in Penang, uh, and a few other startups, another Singapore-based startup. Uh, and uh, I also have a tequila company, an Australian tequila company. Uh, but it comes out of it comes out of Mexico. Uh, and actually, I invested in that because I wanted to see what it was like to actually make something real, like something physical. Is really different to invest in a tequila company than it is in, in a tech startup. I can tell you that. Because you actually have to move the alcohol around, and you have to stop drinking the profits, uh, which is difficult. But that was that's a pretty interesting one that I'm doing now. Um, so a lot of this, like I said, it's my own view. It comes from the work I've done across uh, all these markets. I've worked in these markets that I'm going to talk about. Uh, if you disagree with me, that's great too, and you can raise your hands. So, but I feel like this, and I can be out of date on some things. So if you feel like uh, what I'm saying is not accurate, please let me know. I'd love to update uh, and get a better view of things. Because some of the, the markets uh, I haven't traveled in, in, in you know, maybe six months or longer. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what's really you know, driving a lot of interest now. And what's driving a lot of the interest, I use Microsoft Sway, by the way. I thought it would be more risky that way. Uh, what's really driving a lot of the interest uh, is uh, you know, the ASEAN economy. And this is a very very hot economy when it comes uh, looking at things quite globally. And I think most people here 
you know, you know, you know who's members of that, that economy. But what really drives a lot of investment is when you look at this, we have 600 million people that are basically becoming middle class. A lot of people that are going through a lot of transition, right? So uh, we're seeing that most of the investment is based upon people that are moving in and starting to go from, let's say, you know, uh, less skilled jobs to more skilled jobs. There are people that are consuming media online, consuming media mobile first, right? These are mobile first economies. So we look at this as a market, and it's very easy to say, oh, that's just like a really big country. 600 million people going forward. But it is, you know, perhaps one of the most diverse places on, on the planet. Some interesting stats, though, about it, and I don't want to go through and do like a lot of stats, but this is a very, very young place. So over half the people are under 30. Whereas in a lot of the world, especially a lot of the developed world with disposable income, uh, we're seeing, of course, it's aging. It's an aging population. But uh, not so much for Aussie. Uh, if we look at it, we have a $2.4 trillion GDP here. I think it was the seventh largest economy right now in the world, at about half of the landmass of the US. Um, but it is extremely diverse. We have every, almost every major religion here represented in mass. Right? 240 million Muslims, 125 million Christians, 150 million Buddhists, a wide range, Hindus, uh, lots of smaller different types of religions. That's just religion. Right? Beyond that, we have different kinds of governments, we have communism, we have democracies, we have capitalism, we have monarchs. Uh, it's about everything that you can kind of look at. So a lot of investors want to look at ASEAN as one big market, and that's a mistake. The diversity is amazing. But there are some things that we can do to kind of uh, enter these markets and take advantages, I think, of overall market synergy. And that's where things get really interesting in ASEAN, because these markets do have differences. We have some advantages in some markets and challenges in other markets. And that's a little bit what we're going to talk about tonight. From an investment profile, here's what I didn't actually uh, know until I did a little bit of research. But the ASEAN Five, <coughs> the major powerhouses of the ASEAN economy right now, so Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, uh, actually got more FDI than China in 2013. So we have a lot of direct investment coming in to the region. Uh, and also accounts for 38% of all the IPOs. Uh, and I think you know, now you can see that's really attracting a lot of local VCs. Of course, in Singapore, we've got foreign VCs. But we're also seeing that throughout all the other different economies. Um, however, it's almost all C. It's all mostly small bets right now in Aussie. So I think pretty much globally, we're seeing it's, it's a lot of lack of getting kind of Series A investment. Seeds there, pre-seeds there, early stages is there. But when you start to get that Series A, it dries up quite a bit across the different regions. So what I want to do is kind of drill down a little bit into the different markets so you can kind of see how everything plays out. And then we can zoom in into, into Indonesia and see where it falls. So one of the markets uh, that uh, we work quite a bit uh, with, especially from the Singapore side, uh, is Malaysia. So Malaysia is about 30 million people. Um, I, I went ahead and put the GDPs per person per capita on each one of these so you can see kind of where everything lies. Uh, this is in US dollars. So we got about 10 and a half uh, thousand dollars in Malaysia. Um, they're doing quite a bit right now. So the government's doing a lot in Malaysia. They have what's called a cradle fund, which is a government fund for early stage. Um, they have the magic accelerator there, which is looking to do 50 startups a year. Uh, I think out of the 50, uh, something like 20 of them is actually foreign, foreign based startups, foreign, foreign startups that come over. Uh, Malaysia uh, has a lot of good developers. The cost of living is reasonable. It's probably middle of the line when it comes to expense for the domestic market. Uh, but the hottest Malaysian startups are in Singapore. I don't know if that's good or that's bad, but the my taxis, these guys, they're all based in Singapore. And that's because in order for you to have an ecosystem, right, we talk about startup ecosystem, you have to have an exit. You have to have an accelerator. Otherwise, it's a lifestyle business. And until an ecosystem can support some way to accelerate out, it's not a complete system. And that's where we start to see that we need to bring these different countries together to take advantages uh, of the different markets. So Malaysia suffers a bit with uh, actually having guys 
get beyond that early stage. But they have a lot of good developers, it's pretty entrepreneurial, uh, and the government's really done a lot in the last year or so to help foster uh, startups. So Thailand. Thailand's a very interesting market, about 67 million, uh, almost 6,000 uh, GDP. Heavily telco. So every telco in Thailand has an accelerator. In fact, Thailand's almost uh, it's almost at a startup frenzy. There are so much, there's so many startups now in Thailand, and so many different programs, and so many people competing for eyes that it, it's almost saturated because um, they actually haven't had a lot of success as a startup yet. But everyone is is looking for a piece of Thailand, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's heavy investment from all the telcos, so all the telcos have involvement. The government has involvement. So they have a SIPA, which is the Software uh, Information Promotion Agency, I think is what it stands for. And they've got an accelerator. They actually have old money. It's very rare in Aussie. It's one of the few countries that was never colonized or didn't have a massive war. So they've got people who, whose money goes back generations and generations. We call these high net wealth individuals. And these are people who also like to invest in startups. And that's unique to the area. You don't see that so much in the other Aussie uh, economies because of what, you know, whatever reason, you know, things that have happened, either colonization uh, or war, most of the money is kind of new money or government money, uh, a lot of property money. But Thailand's different uh, in that sense. It also has a lot of digital nomads. Do you guys know what those are? Digital nomads? So these are guys that usually are guys, men or women, when I say guys, I mean everybody, uh, that have uh, usually technical skills, and they can be anywhere in the world. And they can do a startup, or they can do a business, and they're not really worried about where they're sitting. A lot of people choose Thailand. It's famous for a lot of tourism, it's easy to get in and out of, it's pretty darn uh, reasonably priced, there's good beaches. Uh, and so, there are a lot of startups in Thailand that have nothing to do with Thailand. There are people that, this is the place they want to live. They like the food, they like the beach, they like uh, the lifestyle. Uh, so we see that more in Thailand, I think, than anywhere else. Um, and the VCs there are also tend to have money raised from Hong Kong. Because a VC can actually raise in Hong Kong and sit in Thailand and pay no tax. And that's a little bit unique about that market. And if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand or just say, Joe, I disagree. <coughs> just let me know. Uh, a lot of the Thai uh, startups, they focus heavily on tourism. As you would guess, right? Because it's a tourism market. And that tends to be a lot of what people are focusing on, two different kinds of tours, hotels, uh, service industry is quite big. Uh, and they haven't been going, gone too regional. The Malaysian ones go much more regional, fast, uh, faster, I think, than Thailand. Uh, Philippines, now we're starting to get into some bigger numbers of people. Almost 100 million people. Uh, GDP is not that high. And believe it or not, uh, actually 5% of the GDP is all based on call centers. Right? So, uh, if you ever had to call somebody up and they're actually in Manila, for example, it's a huge part of their GDP, and up to 10% of their GDP is remittance-based. So overseas Filipinos who are working within nursing, or uh, they do uh, a lot, you know, in Singapore they do a lot of home care, they do a lot of uh, uh, raising children, uh, and they have to send their money back. 10% of the GDP is a really large number. Uh, right now in the Philippines, there's only really two big players when it comes to startup accelerators and against the telcos, and they're both in Manila. Cebu's doing a little bit south. These guys, they tend to focus quite a bit on ag tech, because Philippines is big uh, into rice. Rice Institute's a big, uh, you know, a big influence there, there too. Uh, believe it or not, they focus on call centers, because that's a major part of the economy, so we see these call center startups there. Um, and they actually work uh, a lot within safety, because safety's a big concern. The Philippines is unique also that whenever I do events, I see the most women in entrepreneurship in the Philippines. We see entire engineering teams which are female, and, and that's a lot, of, a lot of cultural reason for that. Uh, so their startups, uh, a lot of them do focus on safety, and work, uh, overseas workers is another big focus for those startups. So it's still very heavily culturally influenced. Sure. Joe, just a comment here, because I, I, I do work a lot with Spanish companies as well. <laughs> Very interesting backups from uh, Spanish uh, venture capital. A lot of Spanish, a lot of Spanish yeah, venture capitalists they, they, um, in, in fact, one of the dairy companies that I'm working for, uh, for 
um, I, I can't tell the name, but they're going to put like big funds into, into the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, because of the Spanish connection, yeah. which most uh, people don't, don't realize yeah. in, in ASEAN. So that's a good point. So the Philippines is extremely multicultural in the sense of their own background, right? So heavy Spanish, heavy, uh, a lot of Chinese and American influence within the Philippines. Uh, so I didn't know that, thank you. I didn't know that there was a lot of Spanish uh, DC. Yeah, there. Uh, the, the same thing. It's uh, the telco, the Spanish telco, telco is, is, is dying to grow. So, yeah. you know, they're willing to invest. Yeah. yeah, it's heavy influence with the telcos. Um, also, the level of English is, 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 is about as, as good as you're going to get in this part of the world. It's usually quite good. Uh, a lot of developers, too, heavily in .NET and PHP. Uh, the cost of the developers is, is it's pretty good. It's getting, uh, Philippines is getting a little more expensive. We're starting to see there be a, a rise in costs. Uh, and so some people are starting to go to other markets for developers. Um, and very, very little funding, actually. We hear that quite a bit. Early stage, yes. Fall in funding, uh, not a lot. It's a pretty tough market. And in fact, uh, we look at bringing some of those guys over to Singapore once they've gone through programs. Vietnam. So also almost about 90 million people. Uh, GDP is quite low, really, uh, overall, compared to the other countries, 1.9 uh, 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 thousand. But what's interesting with Vietnam is uh, it actually was, at one point, it was the fastest growing market for Apple products. So what we're seeing in Vietnam, um, well, first of all, Vietnam is almost two countries. The North and the South separate, in many ways. Language is still very separate. The accent is almost a completely different dialect. Uh, and startup ecosystems are separate. So in the north, in Hanoi, we see a lot of uh, mobile focus. The big investment there is a POTA. Uh, uh, Golden Gate Ventures has, has invested there. That's a mobile uh, platform. Uh, the government invests heavily more on the north. And that's, of course, where the head headquarters are in the capital. Uh, in, in Saigon, in Ho Chi Minh City, it depends on where you are, which one you call that, by the way. If you're in Saigon, call it Saigon. If you're in the north, you can call it Ho um, We saw a major investment in e-commerce last year. A lot of startups, a lot of startup space, it, it basically all collapsed. So all the big, big investments, Cyber Agent Ventures, IDG, uh, there's some big ones that went to Project Lana, was a big e-commerce effort. It basically, it all shut down. And the major co-working space actually shut down there too. Uh, I think it was just too early an early push into this market. People saw 90 million people, uh, you know, the GDP is going up very rapidly. Uh, people are starting to buy cars, buy nice, you know, more expensive uh, electronics. Uh, and and it, just went, it just pushed it a little bit too fast, I think. Uh, uh, Vietnam is also very hard to invest into. So uh, when I was a kid, there was a commercial on television. They call it the Roach Motel, with a little, little sticky box where the bugs would go into the sticky box and they don't come out, so the roaches go in but they don't come out, is that that's how foreign direct investment works in Vietnam. <laughs> the money goes in, but wow, to get it out, is, it's, it's tough, right? The economy, they don't really support that right, right now. So a lot of the investments in Vietnam, guess, guess where they actually exist? Singapore. Singapore. They'll spin up a Singapore holding company. Um, great developers there, though. Really good price. Really entrepreneurial market. Uh, one probably one of my favorite markets to, to, to go and to spend time. Uh, really, Saigon, Hanoi, a little bit of Da Nang in the middle. Um, but it's 90 million people, and that economy is really, really taking off. It's exciting. Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, uh, you know, 8 million people. Well, that GDP is very different, right? 38,000 a year, U.S. Um, Hong Kong really. It's an interesting market. It's pushing a lot of the fintech. Um, but the problem with Hong Kong, I guess, is I, I don't see a lot of startups coming out of Hong Kong. And there's a lot of VC funds that are Hong Kong based, but they're not in Hong Kong. And I think that's for a, a few re reasons. Um, you know, first of all, you know, Hong Kong's kind of place that exists within the economy. You know, for a long time, it was the, it was the place that brokered uh, you know transactions into China historically, right? And for a long time, it was the, the only way that Taiwan could even communicate with China. Um, but now Hong Kong gets to be more and more and more Chinese. Uh, we see that focus is within China, and not so much Southeast Asia. Uh, 
and I don't see, I just don't see a lot of startups coming out of there uh, right now. The level of English has dropped dra dramatically over the years. The ability to communicate in English has really, really uh, changed a lot. Um, and now people are launching startups that have been into China uh, from Hong Kong, but there's almost less and less reason to do that. Uh, and you know, basically, when it comes to the PRC, it's it's a better interest for them to have you know more things within Shanghai and, and Beijing than Hong Kong. So it's in, in many places, uh, I don't know quite where that sits in the future of startups. Uh, an upside to it is, if you wanted to do IoT, this would be an interesting place to do it, because what's what's the you know what's the big thing with IoT? Somebody has to make the tea. And at least in Hong Kong, you've got access to people to be able to, to actually build uh, the factory side, right, across to Shenzhen, for example. Um, but there's some other places to do that. But right now, Hong Kong's been pretty, it's been pretty <coughs> soft, I would say. Anyone disagree? Anyone work with Hong Kong? Uh, just a little comment here. Uh, I actually supporting your view, uh, because I live in Hong Kong for five years. Uh, uh, I, I feel it's more and more moving towards China. Like, yeah. OpenRice.com is here. Uh, it, it's very popular, you know, like uh, in Hong Kong, but not so popular in Indonesia for whatever the reason is. But you know, going to China, they're pushing it. Yeah. They they see themselves as Chinese, yeah. where the Singaporeans see themselves more like we're international. Yeah, I agree. I think I think Hong Kong is extremely it's extremely China oriented, uh, and I don't see startups moving into Southeast Asia or ASEAN market from China so much. And I also share your view because um, having this Chinese face, not speaking Mandarin, right, speaking English, it's very awkward. Yeah. The, the level of English is appalling and the, the level of Mandarin is not that good. Yeah. And it, it, it is really like an awkward market without being, you know, with a lot of uh, respect here, I'm, I'm saying it, right? And I, 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 uh, Pui Chan Pui. Hablo Espanol. That's all I There you go. <laughs> yeah, it is. The language barrier is quite. And it's less foreigners, too. We see a big influx of ex expats uh, migrating uh, from Hong Kong to Singapore, for example, because it's got more and more Chinese, uh, more and more the companies are very much focused within China. Australia. So, you guys have heard of Australia, right? Uh, Australia is, uh, you know, you know, very fantastic GDP. Small, relatively small domestic market at about 23 million now, uh, but uh, actually a very high margin market. Uh, so if you're selling uh, services, uh, the margins are quite good in many cases within Australia. Um, most of the activity is in Sydney. There are, yeah, very, we have some Melbourne people. Here. Yeah. <laughs> there is some activity in Melbourne, but it's. It's, it's more heavily right now in, in Sydney. Um, there's a, a couple of good programs. One's Maruti. Uh, the other one is another one called Startling, uh, which is both, both in Sydney. Uh, Melbourne's got one called uh, Angel Q, Perth's got one called Space Q, uh, and there's lots of co working spaces. Really, lots of good developers and good developers in more newer technologies. Uh, so, a lot of Ruby guys, a lot of per, uh, Python guys, not Pearl, Python guys. Um, everyone's very expensive. Salaries are high, cost of living is quite high. Uh, the tax system has been reformed some. Uh, up until recently, uh, if you had a startup and you had a valuation of that startup, let's say you had a startup and I went to an investor and I said, hey, investor, my startup's worth a million dollars. That's my valuation. We know it's not really worth that, but that's what I say it's worth. Uh, it used to be the tax office would say, that's great, you know, it was $400,000 cash. And you're like, oh. Wait, no, my startup's only worth about a dollar. I made a mistake. Uh, and that's difficult. So without a progressive tax system, that hurts it quite a bit. Um, also, there's early stage funding, later stage funding still uh, uh, more rare. And um, unfortunately, it suffers from a free trade agreement with the US. So if you're a really good, hot developer or entrepreneur, you can just fly to Silicon Valley almost to get a visa. It's, it's almost trivial. There's a whole set of visas put aside just for Australians. Uh, and they never reached the limit on that. And that hurts a bit the market a bit. Now, which one you mean, you know, they'll never reach the limit. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, and that hurts it a little bit because you can, you can go to a, uh, another market quite easily. Uh, so we see a lot of brain drain when it comes to entrepreneurship uh, within Australia. But one very interesting thing about Australia, and most people don't know about this, but again, if you want 
to do a startup, you have to have an exit. Australia has one of the only markets that you can exit on. The ASX is actually some place you can get listed and you can IPO uh, fairly easily. Uh, and that's unique within Asia. Uh, so we do see a lot of startups that they do list on the, on the uh, ASX. Uh, and then Jamie, you're going to go into more detail with, with Australia a little bit later. Uh, New Zealand, do we have any Kiwis here? We got some delays. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, New Zealand's a very interesting market because New Zealand basically said, hey, hey, look, there's a flag. We're just going to, you know, change ours by uh, taking a star away. <laughs> so, and that's about it for New Zealand. No. Uh, New Zealand's interesting. It has a very, very, very small domestic market. Right? So, four million people, half all in one city. But, in many ways, like a lot of countries, it knows it has to innovate. And so, They've made up the small domestic market by having a, a very progressive tax system. Uh, much like a, a Singapore in many senses, uh, they, have, uh, they have no capital gains, no interest, they have different tax programs. So we actually see that Australian startups go to New Zealand in order to go into their different uh, accelerator and incubator programs. Um, so in that case, they've been quite, quite progressive. They do have some uh, funding. Most things are in Auckland. Uh, but there is very, very, it's a very small domestic market in that sense. China. Well, China is China. So, uh, GDP 6,000, almost 7,000, uh, you know, 1.4 billion people. A lot of people say, why don't I go to China? It has a giant market. It does have a giant market. Uh, absolutely. The thing is with China is I don't think China needs you. I'll be honest about this. <laughs> Unless you're bringing some value to the market. Oh, we're going to teach English online. That's great. There's, there's more people studying English in China than anywhere else in the world. There's also more people speaking English there than many places in the world. Um, I think that China has moved so fast now and has so much funding that I don't know if you're not Chinese what you're going to bring to that market. Honestly. Uh, and they can clone you and spin up your ideas so fast that by the time you finish your, your pitch, there might be, you know, the competitors already on the market. Uh, and now they've gotten, of course, so much acceleration that they're targeting other markets. Uh, and uh, David's got a lot of experience and, and a small amount of opinion of, of, about the market. Uh, but it is, it's, it's moving so fast with so many people that uh, it can really, it can chew you up as a startup. And, and, and you either do China or you do not do China. There's no, there's no, you know, halfway uh, market for those guys. Uh, so, even at this point, that Hong Kong may not have a lot of value. Sure. Just a quick question, Joe. Would you invest in China yourself personally? Me? I don't do China personally. No. Okay, great. Personally, Maybe. because I don't know the market well enough, uh, and again, I have no advantage. Uh, to right. Invest into that market. Because um, in, in the past, right, I deal with sustainability products yeah. like the, the Danish just uh, have like Fortune two for China yeah. and Fortune five for Europe, right? Yeah. They they always do that. Right now, you cannot invest money in China without having an R&D function. Yeah, they, they want your R&D. They're not interested. And also, you have to expatriate funds. You have to have. Uh, you have to deal with. <coughs> even if you, if you if you spin up AWS and you want to use the China AWS cloud, you can't. You have to have a Chinese entity to actually spin up the, the instance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I actually tell you can go there to learn. You can go there to meet. You might be able to go there to get some some investment coming out of China. But China as a market, I would, I would definitely caution. Overseas Chinese as a market is quite interesting though. You've got a lot of business people traveling, a lot of tourists traveling. There you've got an advantage. Right? There you might have something to offer. China itself though, uh, it's very fragmented. Um, it's, it's dominated by some you know, very big domestic uh, uh, companies. If you look at the foreign companies that have gone in there, who, who has done well? So Microsoft and Apple. Apple, yeah. Hmm? Ford, I mean, high tech, sorry, the services. You know, Google's had to, to, to leave. It's a tough market. Um, I just caution uh, people to go into it. The other China. Ooh, the other China. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, Taiwan, sorry. Uh, Chinese Taipei, is that the, is that the political correct way? Okay, much smaller market, fairly decent uh, GDP. Uh, I find that this is an underserved market. There's a lot of good tech talent, mostly in games and hardware, 
There's only really one big uh, accelerator there called AppWorks. But what they're focusing on right now is IoT. So if you wanted to do IoT, go into the Internet of Things, and if for some reason the thing part has IP to it, right, the, the hardware, which I'm talking against itself because I think we really want the software to have the, the, uh, the IP to it, um, there's pretty good uh, intellectual property laws in Taiwan. You can get some good factories in Taiwan. Uh, that's where I would have at least the early part of, of my, my T and IoT done. Uh, it suffers from some language barrier. The level of English is not, it's not super great. Uh, it has some not progressive taxes right now that holds it back. Uh, but it, it is really unique. So if someone was going to pitch to me a really heavy IoT play, uh, I would probably connect you with our partners at AppWorks to see if that was a good uh, match. Um, the government actually knows that it needs to keep growing this uh, ecosystem. So it will actually pay its startups to go to a foreign startup uh, accelerator program. Excuse me. So they'll actually get $20,000 US if you get enrolled in an external accelerator program. So they know that they need to build that ecosystem. But they need to do some really uh, interesting tax reforms before uh, I think they're going to get that part. Uh, Korea. Uh, Korea, 50 minutes South Korea. <laughs> the North Korean market is very difficult. Uh, unless, we, unless you're really good at uh, missile technology, it's not going to be uh, South Korean market is a little more diverse. They have things like electricity. Um, South Korea is, is interesting. It's an extremely wealthy market. Uh, I've lived, I lived in Korea for about uh, five years. Um, it's very isolated in, in many ways. Culturally, it's, it's completely homogeneous. Uh, the way the style of apps themselves are very unique tastes culturally. Uh, we don't see a lot of startups that come out of Korea. They don't launch a lot uh, internationally. And I think it's because they have very unique tastes when it comes to style. It's also so heavily connected. Like when I lived there in 2000 and, uh, 2001, 2002, I had a 100 megabit wireless uh, throughout the city for about 30 US dollars a month. That was a long time ago. So the apps were very heavy. They're not going to work. You can't take Yuji, you could take, could take a Korean game and, and come over here where the infrastructure is a little bit different. Maybe the connectivity is not quite as good, where the latency is a little bit bigger. This won't work because they have such amazing infrastructure uh, and huge credit card penetration, huge e commerce penetration. You can buy things that deliver the same day. However, even though the startups themselves uh, might not go globally, the money has been going a little bit more global. So both Japan and Korea has pretty inexpensive money when it comes to VC funding. Low interest rates, I mean, I, I don't know what the interest rate is. is. Does Japan even have a positive interest rate right now? I don't know, it's pretty low. Korea is also fairly low. Uh, and so we're starting to see these guys are funding a lot of projects. SoftBank, for example, both the Japanese and the Korean one, of course. Uh, are investing a lot. Uh, for both those markets, so the money is a little bit slower. But if you can get access to it, it's, it's quite reasonable money. Um, so what I want to do too now is I'm going to zoom in a little bit more into uh, Singapore and Indonesia. And what's interesting between Singapore and Indonesia is I think those two markets, although very close together geographically, are probably, I can't imagine, two more different markets when it comes to uh, the demographics. So Singapore, you know, we've got 5.4 million people. 10% uh, of that, I think, is completely foreign works, workforce. Another 10% are permanent residents, and then the rest are actual <coughs> Singaporeans. Uh, $55,000 a year GDP. That's a big difference than other markets. Um, and everybody's online. Now that's changing a little bit. Some of the other markets, a lot of a lot of people are online. Uh, but we have 1.6. Uh, smartphones per person. Now, I only got one smartphone, but David personally uh, contributes with his array of five smartphones <laughs> <laughs> his, around his abdomen at any one time. They're so like Tinder, 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 Tinder. <laughs> huh? Intimate. More intimate. <laughs> that's, that's great. Good to know. I learned a little bit about you. But uh, massive smartphone pop, uh, penetration, massive credit card penetration. So what's happened is, you know, Singapore as a domestic market is a complete aberration when it comes to Aussie market. 
I'll, I'll tell you this right now. If you solve something for the, for the Singaporean domestic market, it doesn't mean that you can do it anywhere else. It's really hard. It's like you've solved it for like the easiest possible logistics market, or the easiest like, no possible e-commerce market, or the wealthiest market. So it's tough to say you, you, if you invest in like a Singaporean startup, if it's solving just domestic problems, where does it go after that? Five million people, even though they're very wealthy, is only so interesting. Now, you can still IPO, you can do a Vicky or something like that, uh, or you can grow like Masola is a good you know, luxury one. Uh, like the Red Mart, for example, is something that's solved something quite domestically in this market with uh, e-commerce, but they're pivoting over into logistics. Uh, and their next step is to expand into, into KL. That's going to be a very different market than, than Singapore. 98% um, of the people have bank accounts. Uh, and it is expensive. You want to do a developer in, in, in Singapore, a developer out, out of university, $50,000 US. Yeah, right out of university. It's a big, big cost. Uh, and so that's tough. Now, uh, massive amount of funding. In terms of the VC market in 2013, Singapore had 17 times the amount of VC capital available than Australia. Huge difference. Series A is not a problem. Uh, I can name four funds between December and now that have raised over $100 million each. Uh, because it's easy to do business. Okay? It's, 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 if you have a Singapore entity, you have access to so many different funds. The government has funds. If you're a Singaporean PR above, you get all kinds of grants. Uh, you know, where is Sequoia based here in Asia? It's based in Singapore. That's going to be generally where the VCs are going to sit first, right? It's an easy market. Money goes in, money goes out. Uh, all of our bank accounts work in 17 different currencies. Uh, it's a very easy market. But there's nothing domestic to that market when it comes to startups. And it's expensive. Really expensive in many cases. In contrast, uh, in Indonesia, this is a very different market than Singapore, even though it's so close. Uh, the GDP, for example, is uh, about one tenth, even less than one tenth of what it is in, in Singapore. But you know, you're talking about 250 million people. So Indonesia is going to be 70 percent of the Aussie and GDP in the future. People are extremely excited about Indonesia. This is going to this is going to be a powerhouse uh, of the uh, the Aussie market. Um, and even though the percentages are not that high, for example, for social media, because of the population, that's still a lot of people. Right? You still reach a lot of people. Uh, you know, on Facebook. Most people here are on Facebook. If they're on social media, they're on Facebook. I mean, uh, here, this is a stat from last year, there's a 71 million people online. It's a lot of people. Uh, smartphone penetration is still fairly light when it comes to overall population. Uh, for the mobile population, it has a pretty good penetration. Um, but guess what? There's no credit cards. <laughs> fairly, I mean, basically, there's no credit cards. Credit card penetration, is really, really low. Without credit cards, without payment systems, B2C startups suffer. It's a hurdle. Okay? You have to take money. And you have to do it in some electronic way, right? So what do we have? We have cash on delivery, right, and bank transfer. So you want to do e-commerce, you're not using credit cards to reach people in this market. Um, now, developers, are you know, about one-eighth the cost as they are in uh, Singapore. Uh, and then we're starting to see now it's moving out of Jakarta, right? There's other regions that are having developers. Uh, so it is much, much, much more reasonable cost uh, to be able to do uh, develop. And there's, there's some good developers here. But you know, we see quite a few of the B2C type uh, plays here. Without payment systems, that's going to be pretty hard. Right? But we're starting to see what? Massive investment in e-commerce. I hope that goes well. It did not go well in Vietnam. And so I think a lot of, there's a lot of wait and see to see if, can we solve payment systems? Can we solve logistics? You know, traffic, traffic in Jakarta is uh, challenging. <laughs> um, and that's going to be hard to do you know, deliveries, for example. Uh, but again, this is going to be the powerhouse you know, definitely going, going forward when it comes to the GDP. So it's, it's attracting quite a lot of uh, attention. Um, but you know, this is your market. Is there anything that you felt like I, I didn't? I said it was unfair. Absolutely. No, 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 it's unfair. I wasn't going to actually really touch on it. Is the new? No, that quiet. Goodness <laughs> me. Okay. Um, is the new free trade agreement that's coming up? Um, 
I keep hearing that there's a massive growth in digital business in all of these markets, yet the government policies in terms of data sovereignty uh, are quite anti that sort of environment. So what do you see as the impact for uh, startups as the bar can describe versus in a post free trade agreement? So I, to be honest with you, I don't know I don't know the details of the free trade agreement. Uh, I can touch a little bit when you're talking about data sovereignty. When I worked at Amazon Web Services worldwide, when it came to accessibility to use clouds, so clouds are very important to startups. Right? You don't want to buy, I'm not selling you guys at AWS. I don't, work for the, I don't work for the bookstore anymore, I work for the phone company now. Um, but you, need, you really need the cloud. The clouds are basically fertilized for those startups. Indonesian, Indonesia has the most draconian cloud based policies out of every country that AWS works in. You are almost not legally allowed to use servers offshore for so many ranges of businesses compared to other, other markets. And that's, that's quite, quite difficult. Uh, I think originally laws are passed to keep people who are going to run in and build data centers. And some did, but like some didn't. So that's actually a, a bit of a challenge. I don't know about the free trade here that much. So, so. The, the main concept behind it is, is a little like this program between Australia and the US. Ah. It's the flexibility of data movement. Yeah. And this thing up right from the country overseas. Is it between, it's between yeah. Indonesia and where? No, no, it's ASEAN. So it's ASEAN free trade agreement. But the other thing is, it's so this is moving more digital yeah. than e-commerce. It's going to be completely counterintuitive in terms of, hey, we've signed an agreement, but why is nobody taking it? Yeah. So um, I'm just wondering from a startup perspective, all of this wonderful growth we've seen in these markets is actually going to be hindered by the fact that, well, that capital won't actually be able to go for those markets because other limited agents are going to play It's difficult. Like I said, the free trade agreement, I would say, when it comes to startups, uh, was a negative impact for Australia mm -hmm. because people could move to a more lucrative market. Exactly. So I don't know if it would have that kind of effect. If it allowed it allowed more free free movement of, of funds, because if you're a VC and you want to write a check, you want to write a check to a company based in Singapore, it's easy. If you want to write a check to any other country, there's, there's, there's more consequences. Yeah, you have there's more process, and there's always been it's never going to be easier. It's always going to be a little bit harder. So if it, you know, if it does that, then it's, it's probably good. But there is there's going to be a downside. I think you know, it's, that's kind of Great. Um, so, any other questions? Or this is my big, this is Joe's big overview. I'm a technologist too. If you want to know what I think about, you know, developers or technology or how. To be honest with you, if I was going to do a, a, a an Aussie startup, a startup in, in this part of the world, I would look at things quite globally, depending on what you're trying to do. You know, obviously there's a huge market here in Indonesia to capture within itself. Uh, but I would leverage the strengths and the weaknesses of the different environments. I would, if I wanted an IPO, I would think about the ASX. If I wanted funding, uh, I would think about Singapore. If I wanted developers, I would look at all the markets to see where I could get developers. And if I wanted to attack domestic markets, if I had something, uh, you know, some special way that I could enter Indonesia, and you can solve problems here, that also probably applies to many, you know, very similar problems in Vietnam or uh, some of the other developing markets. Uh, I would look at that way, really. Uh, I would encourage you to take a very uh, macro view uh, of the environment. If funding is hard here, why not get funding where it's easy? If developers are uh, less uh, expensive here, why not get the, the, the Singaporean companies to use developers here? There's some good opportunities uh, when you look at things at that macro level. So, that's all I have for my overview. Uh, yeah, sure, so I do have one question. On that basis, are you seeing the VCs create themselves they can't hear me in the back? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. I do. Uh, yeah, expat kids, no problem. Um, so, you talk about the diversity, and I just said as well, we've got a bunch of friends who run startups, and they've got the developers in the Philippines yeah. or here. Yeah. Um, they're setting up uh, their operations in Singapore, they've got the good market in places like uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, etc. Yeah. So, it's very fragmented. One of the biggest challenges that they shared with me is the fact that we've got to set up all these different entities in order to be able to connect with, they can pay people in different markets, they can collect money in different markets. Are you seeing any VCs who are open to try and bridge that, I guess, multitude of different environments? Because if you're a startup, how much bandwidth do you really have in terms of driving your business and actually yeah. maximizing what ASEAN can potentially bring? So, um, you know, mostly what I see is that the VCs, the very first thing they'll do is, if you're not in Singapore, they're going to spin you up and move everything to Singapore. 
and then you're going to deal with just whatever your domestic market was. And that's kind of your step one. So I don't see very many startups that go, okay, we have 50, we're going to hit 50 different markets at the same time. So normally I do see like the guys started in the Philippines, started in Indonesia, started in Malaysia, they move operations to Singapore to get funding, and then they basically treat the other co uh, company as an R&D outsourcing center that then invoices back into Singapore and runs at cost. That's, that's fairly common. I don't see too many doing more than one at once, and I don't know anyone who's really helping to do that. But the thing that I've got in Vietnam that I'm working on, that's what's called a venture builder, so we do all your technology. But we only do it with investment, so you don't have to hire developers. So we invoice, everybody can invoice into Singapore pretty well, in that case, that's fairly, fairly easy to do. I think that's one of the reasons they do it. Um, there are a few that are doing it, I don't know who's helping. That might be a good startup idea. A VC that helps you be, you know, con audio. Easy. So, any other any other questions? I'll be around uh, here too. Uh, I've got a few startups. Uh, uh, we'll go into the, the other section and we can talk uh, a little bit about the ecosystem. And I'll talk about just sort of my angel investor in for the next. Yeah, Joe next will part. be on the next panel. Yeah. So I'll turn it over to uh, David. Thank well, you, guys. Joe now is an angel investor.